The more things change, the more things change. And we're lucky they do, at least in the scientific idea department. Here are some of the wacky scientific theories that were in vogue 200 years ago. Nowadays, the idea of scrubbing up is absolutely basic to the medical field. It should be basic to everyone else, too, just saying. But travel back to the 1820s and ask a doctor to break out the soap and you might get the old stink eye, or dysentery. In the early 19th century, hand washing was largely seen as a cultural or religious practice. Some early writers and scientists, like the 12th century Moses ben Maimon, or Maimonides, did make a connection between washing one's hands and better health outcomes, but they were outliers. In the 19th century, hospitals were often seen as places where you could get sick and die in short order. Doctors routinely went from procedure to procedure without washing up in between. One might conduct an autopsy and then attend to a birth, for instance. It wasn't until the 1840s that Ignaz Semmelweis took a hard look at mortality numbers in Austria's Vienna General Hospital and realized hand washing could save lives. When he implemented the practice, it dramatically cut down on deadly infections in the hospital's maternity ward. But Semmelweis was reluctant to publish his research, given the dramatic resistance from other doctors who didn't want to be seen as dirty disease carriers. Semmelweis's abrasive approach didn't help, but who could blame him under the circumstances? He was later committed to a mental institution. Phrenology, the art of reading a person's fortune by feeling the bumps on his head. For a while there, the easiest way that you could gain insight into a person's intelligence, future, and indeed their very soul was from the shape of their head. It's based on a complex stew of ideas that first arose in the late 18th century and was immediately controversial. Holy Roman Emperor Francis II even temporarily banned lectures on phrenology. But something about that notion took hold. The Edinburgh Phrenological Society was established in 1820. In the US, phrenology was seen as a prestigious intellectual pursuit. The trend died down in the 1840s, but the ideas persisted into the 20th century. You got some nice bumps, frog. Phrenology was based on the idea that different regions of the brain control different things. Admittedly, that's not far-fetched, but here's where it gets wacky. Phrenology goes on to maintain that the more developed a faculty is, the bigger that part of the brain will be. The idea went on to assume that when a brain bulked up, it would inevitably push out the skull in the surrounding area. A phrenologist would then read the skull for its lumps and bumps. And by the way, the corresponding areas were arbitrarily chosen. But that wasn't the point. The practice of phrenology was often used to enforce restrictions based on race, gender, class, religion, and mental health. Graham crackers are delicious, but their inventor might be horrified to hear that. That would be Sylvester Graham, an American preacher who was also an intense follower of the temperance movement, advocating not just for cutting out alcohol, but just about anything else people enjoyed. The list of no-nos included meat, caffeine, tobacco, soft mattresses, tight clothes, and spices. Not everything Graham thought was nuts. He urged people to get regular exercise and drink plenty of water, for instance. But his namesake Cracker was weird. By the time it debuted in 1829, he developed a pared-down diet that consisted mostly of fruits, veggies, and whole grains. The graham cracker was part of the Graham diet. Originally a bland health food made from whole wheat flour, bran, and molasses, it was far from today's sweet, crunchy snack. No sugar, fat, or salt. The idea was that if it was boring, people wouldn't be tempted to overindulge. Unfortunately, Graham never applied for a patent, so people began messing with the recipe. The version we know now has its roots in a sweetened mass-produced cracker first produced by Nabisco in 1898. I'm going to cut into his back but I heard that it sometimes works. If you had a medical problem in the early 19th century, the doctor might just break out the knives and leeches. It sounds positively medieval now, but by then the practice of bloodletting was so established it didn't warrant a second thought. It has its basis in the idea that the body operates under four humors, black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. An imbalance was thought to cause all manner of illnesses, so it stood to reason that letting some blood would help restore health. To be in ill humor or bad mood comes from the idea of your humors being out of balance. So now you know. It may have seemed pretty professional when the doctor or the local barber surgeon entered a patient's room and broke out his bloodletting kit, but the practice almost certainly killed some. George Washington complained of a sore throat back in 1799, so the physicians bled him of five or more pints. Spoiler, didn't work. A couple of weeks later, he was dead. Then there were the leeches. The 1820s saw an uptick in the use of the tiny bloodsuckers. London St. Thomas Hospital used an estimated 50,000 leeches in 1822 alone. But doctors weren't slapping leeches on you willy-nilly. This was science. Or maybe they just didn't want to touch the slimy little beasts. Whatever the reason, a tube, and not bare hands, was used to direct the animal to the desired body part. 
So why don't we still use leeches today? You big drug companies don't want you to find out about leeches. You know why? Leeches are free. <laughs> yes, sir, I have great respect for the leech. I'm sure the feeling's mutual. Easy there, Cliffy. You might not believe this, but leeches are actually FDA approved. They are still used. It's not some big pharma conspiracy. It's just not super common and more ailment specific. Even if you just glanced at your seventh grade earth sciences textbook, you probably know that our planet is pretty solid, made of rock and semi-liquid magma. But if you were a scientist or a certain sort of know-it-all 200 years ago, you might have a different idea. The notion of a hollow earth hiding unknown wonders within seemed almost possible back then. And it wasn't a new theory. The idea had been around in one form or another since ancient times. Even notable scientists like 17th century astronomer Edmund Halley suggested the inside of the earth was a series of nested shells that messed up compass readings and maybe even contained living beings. The theory got a dubious boost in the 1820s when American John Cleve Sims Jr. loudly proclaimed that both the North and South Poles contained entrances to this hidden world. These soon came to be known as Sims Holes and captured the popular imagination, if not that of his fellow scientists. Sims went on a lecture tour and gained a few notable followers, including former President John Quincy Adams, but he never raised enough funds for a polar expedition. This was likely a good thing for both his crackpot idea and the financial well-being of his investors. All he has proven is that people are willing to pay 12 and a half cents to listen to him. Sims died in Ohio in 1829. His son, Americus, erected a monument at his father's grave complete with a hollow globe. If you didn't know any better, you'd just think he was a fan of donuts. Throughout history, being a woman in need of medical attention was a tough spot to be in. And for a long time, many female ailments were lumped under the blanket term hysteria. It was an old idea. The ancient Greeks even suggested that a uterus could somehow move around inside a body and cause all sorts of trouble. To keep a woman's other organs from being literally suffocated or crushed by the aggressive uterus, one might place offensive smelling things near the head to scare off the womb, and pleasant ones at the patient's other end. Not everyone agreed with this. The ancient physician Galen pushed back, but he also thought humans produced thinking juice he called animal spirits, so don't give him too much credit. Still, even with advances in medical science, early 19th century doctors still blamed all manner of women's issues on hysteria. I cannot sing from the sadness. Hysteria was a convenient excuse to block emotional, irrational, womb-plagued women from, well, everything. We will not rest until we are welcomed in the universities, in the professions, and in the voting booth. Perhaps most shocking of all, or maybe not, hysteria wasn't officially refuted by most professional psychological societies until the 1980s. What causes disease? Back in the early 1800s, a common answer was miasma. This theory, now one of the most famously disproven scientific theories in human history, once argued that illnesses were caused by airborne vapors. For instance, some argued that cholera cases in London were concentrated in low elevation areas because that's where the bad vapors collected. John Snow, the celebrated British doctor you've never heard of and immediately thought of the ice wall one, mapped out cholera cases in poor London neighborhoods and was one of the earliest scientists to suggest that contaminated water might have more to do with public health problems than miasma. But when he died in 1858, people were still skeptical. As you know, he was right. Today, hypnotism walks a fine line between stage trick and legit medical practice. But back in the 1820s, an earlier form of hypnotism was big. Known as mesmerism or animal magnetism, it was first championed by 18th century doctor Franz Anton Mesmer. Dr. Mesmer basically said we were full of magnetic fluid and that a number of illnesses could be explained by problems in the body's magnetic field. The idea shared some intellectual DNA with the concept of the humors, but instead of bleeding or purging a patient, Mesmer and his followers claimed they could somehow manipulate the path of this mysterious magnetic stuff and make a person feel better. Mesmer enjoyed his greatest successes in upper-class circles where rich, presumably bored women with nothing to do flocked to his salon for quasi-mystical treatments. This young woman is in urgent need of the assistance of Franz Anton Mesmer. Other doctors and scientists questioned the idea fairly early on, especially when those well-to-do ladies behaved rather shockingly when under trance. Treatment sometimes induced convulsions, swooning, and other behaviors that many thought were best combined to the bedroom if you catch my drift. But mesmerism stuck around, perhaps in part because of its controversial, almost punk rock reputation. It made it across the Atlantic in the late 1820s, but Americans didn't really embrace the trend until a few decades later when doctors began writing and lecturing on the subject to enraptured audiences. 
Mercury is a powerful toxin that can wreak major havoc on one's nervous system, skin, eyes, kidneys, and more. But while modern exposure often comes in the form of mercury-laced seafood or industrial pollution, people in the 1820s might have been given mercury by their doctors. Throughout the Victorian era, and even into the 20th century, doctors or patients might apply topical mercury solutions, ingest pills, or even inhale vaporized mercury sometimes the deadly effect. Abraham Lincoln himself might have been exposed to dangerous regular doses of mercury, which were a key component of the blue mass pills he took. You try bloodletting. Aye, and some blue mass pills. Mercury. Why chow down on mercury? Some out there suggest Lincoln took them to combat the depression that reportedly dogged him throughout his life. But he stopped taking the medication shortly after becoming president, after noticing it caused emotional disturbance rather than treating it. Mercury was by then a long-established way to address mental illness, yellow fever, and syphilis, among many other maladies. The image of Frankenstein's monster rising from a table in the midst of an electrical storm is dramatic, but it's actually based in reality. By the 1820s, a few intrepid scientists had already been experimenting with mild electrical charges that made deceased subjects, including humans, twitch about in eerie, almost lifelike ways. This was known as galvanism after anatomist Luigi Galvani, who first experimented with electricity in dead frogs in the 1780s. The theory was explored in experiments that were part science, part sideshow, with plenty of sparks and loud bangs to keep audience members on the edges of their seats. Give my creation life! Sky means business. Author Mary Shelley almost certainly heard of it, but she wouldn't mention it until the foreword to an 1831 edition of her novel Frankenstein. Not to get technical, but this was the third edition of Frankenstein, and she did slightly alter some of the tones versus the 1818 original publication. So there could be some influence there. But while most seemed interested in learning more about how muscles worked under the application of electricity, a small number wondered if, just maybe, galvanism could bring someone back from the dead. Scottish chemist Alexander Yore tried to prove the idea in 1818, though as with any other similar experiments, nothing really happened in the reanimating department.